a lot of IT infrastructures are very much based around the idea of backwards looking architecture. So looking at data and data warehouses and deciding um, what happened yesterday, what happened last month as a means to forecast. And that's really important. But what fast data provides is an operational infrastructure so you can decide what to do right now. And that's the critical innovation area that digital business provides is how do I take advantage of data as it's moving, as it's streaming into my firm um, and make decisions that will make my customers happy right now or make my logistics more effective right now or stop an oil well from blowing up right, not really right now, but in a predictive way so that I can uh, do predictive maintenance, for example. These are all examples of big ROI values that you can get out of understanding the now. Let's look at how um, the TIBCO solution, the fast data platform, connects together for a single platform to, to provide the infrastructure for these kinds of applications. For example, in the travel and logistics space, right? the integration layer is the first way that you get data into this fast data platform. So connecting with applications that are in the cloud, with mobile devices and applications that are you know, people checking in on their mobile uh, devices with the streams of weather information, with sensors that are picking up where bags are going. All that data needs to be integrated. And that's the role of the TIPCO Enterprise Service Bus, the integration platform that has been the, you know, TIPCO has been the leader in that, that, that space for years. That data all can come through one bus and be then presented to the layer uh, above for event processing. But first you need um, uh, a master data management infrastructure that allows, if, you, if you're connecting 30 different applications, you want one consistent view of the customer that can be accessed in real time. That's the role of MDM. Together, the integration platform with MDM presents data to the event processing layer, and there's three main components to event processing. Event processing is the core capability of being able to make decisions in real time. So, for example, um, the rule associated with a delayed flight and what to do about it can only be expressed through an event-driven rules system that's highly distributed and scalable throughout an organization. And this is the, the, the role of business events, our, our, our event processing uh, event server, um, which uh, allows business users to express those rules about what's going to happen in real time. So how can event processing help with this digital business transformation? The first thing you need is streaming analytics to take in that IoT-driven streaming information and make decisions on those streams in real time, like aggregating them, looking for trends within the, the, the stream that might predict that the weather is turning bad and can affect um, a particular flight. Then you need rules that look at that, those conditions and make determinations about what actions might be important. And then finally, you need the human interface that lets an operation user see all those conditions, visualize them, graph them, chart them, um, execute new future queries. Those three components are the event processing stack that all fit together and work in conjunction to help make more intelligent, real-time decisions. The real value of having an integrated fast data platform is time to market. Now, time to market has three important um, business benefits. First, just getting the solution into market more quickly. We have one customer that said it would have taken them four years to develop a real-time system that they did in four months with our technology. So getting ideas into market is point number one. But point number two is actually evolving them quickly. So what happens when you determine that I want to adjust a rule that I'm making in? Because change, operational changes are constantly happening. So the ability to cycle them quickly also helps innovate more quickly, and that's the third point. So creating sort of an innovation factory, one of our customers said that they now build with this platform 25 to 30 applications a year, as opposed to what they did previously without the technology, they could only build two or three applications a year. That makes the cycle time of testing new ideas and getting them into the market um, more uh, easy to do. So that innovation um, benefit is another key benefit of the um, of the TIPCO platform. The other business value is really just in making these real-time decisions and there the sky's the limit. Like you, you can't put a price tag on the value of being able to know exactly in real time that you're losing $460 million in, in 40 minutes or the benefit of predicting oil well failure before it happens. Right? We can kind of label that with ROI but in a lot of cases it's a question of massive fundamental shifts in a business 
changing the way you interact with customers to be more real time. So it's more it's a it's a digital interaction model as opposed to the old school. I send a coupon in the mail. This is interacting with customers as they're on their mobile in the store. And these are the kinds of things that customers expect in the travel and logistics industry. Sensors are now being used to detect where devices are, where buses are, where planes are, where um, people are checking in by their mobile devices. If you take that information, combine it, you can get a real-time view of all of your operations and make decisions proactively that will make your, your operations run more smoothly so crews get to the right place at the right time based on that insight and also help you with your customers so that they know that they will get rebooked automatically appropriately according to their, their, their levels. You know, premier um, passengers need to get a special level of service. So this is all, um, these are all examples of decisions that can be made in real time based on that sort of consumption and processing and analytics on fast data as opposed to just big data. Thanks, Mark, for that introduction. I think that's a great way to describe what the fast data platform involves and the value that it can bring to the business. And what I'd like to do is drill down a little bit further and talk about uh, ROI with event processing, uh, look at the event processing core capabilities and how it can drive ROI for both IT and the business. So just to focus on what Mark was talking about when he referred to after-the-fact architectures. Um, this is really where you have a traditional data processing pipeline where you're first storing information, analyzing information, and then acting upon this information. And you might be storing this information in a relational database, you may be using one of the newer NoSQL stores or even a Hadoop environment, but the idea here is that you're first storing the information and again analyzing it and then acting upon it. Now, of course, as you do this, you are really introducing decision latency into the business. Right? It simply takes too long to store information and then go through the different stages and then finally to actually derive a particular action. That that's just takes too long. Right? Well, the maximum value of the identified situation is lost. So, for example, if I'm a customer and I'm waiting at a point of sale device to get a cross sell upsell offer after I've left the store simply doesn't have any value to me. Right? And nor does it have any value to the business providing this capability. So what you've got in this particular situation is a scenario where my data processing pipeline is just taking too long. Right? I can't wait for the information to be stored before I can analyze it and then finally act upon it. With this type of processing pipeline, I'm just making decisions on stale data. And quite frankly, given the amount of information coming into an organization, there's just not enough people um, that I can use to be able to analyze this data properly. So this is where the fast data processing and fast data platform come into play. Right? This is where I'm actually analyzing events as they arrive. So as information is streaming into my environment, whether it's from sensors, clickstream data, and so on, I'm actually analyzing that information as it's being collected. And then, in parallel, I am acting upon this, these, uh, the results of this analysis, and then I'm also storing it and doing my more historical or traditional data processing with that information. But I'm now moving from this process, which simply takes too long, to a process now that allows me to make decisions in a timely, contextual, and relevant fashion. So I'm reducing or eliminating that decision latency and executing analytics on everything at all times. So when looking at the ROI of an event processing platform, one of the things that I often look at is the event value over time. Many of the events that we collect simply lose their value as time progresses. So what I want to do is I want to be able to collect these events as close to the source as possible. I want to be able to maximize the value of these events and I want to be able to make sure that I'm responding appropriately to the situations that these events are telling me about. As time passes, as I mentioned, events tend to lose their value. I might miss the ability to predict a failure. Um, I might uh, give a customer a cross-sell upsell offer uh, when they're no longer in my store. Right? So I need to process these events as soon as they are being generated. And one of the things that this implies is that I need a system that has the ability and the performance to be able to process all of these events close to the source. This is what the event processing platform provides. It allows you to provide these real-time capabilities to the business so that I can take advantage of the events as they are being generated. 
And when you're looking at an event processing platform, you're typically looking for a system that provides four key capabilities. And we will talk about these capabilities as the presentation progresses, and we will also highlight some of these capabilities in the upcoming demonstration. But the idea here is that I want to look at how it ingests data, I want to how, look at how it pre-processes these events, what type of processing and analytics this system provides, and then how it can deliver events to a number of different sources. These types of systems were typically referred to in the past as complex event processing systems. However, with today's digital business, a lot of these capabilities have since progressed. And now what I'm typically looking for is, again, a platform that provides these four key capabilities and a platform that allows me to build systems that are responsive, resilient, message-driven, and elastic. You'll often hear these types of or these characteristics described as reactive applications in the marketplace, but it's really about providing systems that are proactive. Right? I'm looking at these events as they're arriving, I'm analyzing the information as it comes into my environment, and I'm generating immediate and proactive responses. From a business standpoint, this gives me a number of different capabilities. It allows me to automate intrusion detection. It allows me to optimize my marketing campaigns and to be able to adjust those campaigns in real time to how my customers are responding. I'm looking at real time compliance capabilities. I'm looking to predict equipment failures. I'm bringing in weather information, you know, real time weather information, and using that to adjust my business processes. So these are all capabilities that the event processing platform can bring to your business or to your enterprise. So if we drill down on each of the capabilities that I previously highlighted, you're first of all looking at event ingest. Uh, this is where I want to make sure that I can bring information in at the speed at which it's being generated and also from a number of different sources. So sources might be traditional databases, might be files, but they may also be logs from the web logs, could be clickstream data, could be sensor data, social media data. This is all information that I need to be able to bring into my environment and I need to be able to apply intelligence to these events through downstream processing capabilities. So once these events are brought in, I often need to pre-process these events. This may involve filtering the noise out Right, filtering the noise out close to the source so that downstream systems don't get hit with all those extra pieces of data. I might want to transform the information. I might need to normalize it because it comes in in all kinds of weird and wonderful formats. Um, and I may also need to do things like event enrichment. Right? Uh, enrich the event data with information from other stores so that it carries the proper context as it goes through the various stages. I also may want to aggregate events. If I'm collecting sensor data at very, very high rates, I may want to aggregate that sensor data into five second intervals so that those aggregated events can be passed to downstream systems. Once I've collected and pre-processed the data, I then am looking to apply real-time analytics and processing against it. I may want to look at applying R models against my information in real time. I may want to apply event rules against my events. I want to look at applying rules via different metaphors, such as decision tables. I may want to look for patterns within my events. And these are all capabilities that I may want to execute against the inbound event flows. Of course, this is often done in parallel to my traditional batch processing capabilities. So I may take these events as they're being collected and also push them to something like a data lake. And there I may actually go and process the information using historical analytical capabilities, machine learning algorithms, I may do a bulk transformation against the data, and so on. But those batch capabilities will often be done um, in conjunction with or alongside my real-time processing capabilities. Finally, I need to deliver the actions. Right? Now that I've brought in the events, I've applied my analytics and event rules against the information to determine how I want to respond, I need to deliver those responses. So I may deliver those responses to the user via a mobile device. I may send the responses to a, a, you know, another type of application. I may send the responses to a real-time dashboard right, for further monitoring and alert management. Um, I may use those actions to actually generate or trigger a business process or a case management process. Um, if I'm predicted the, um, the impending failure of a piece of equipment, I may want to trigger a maintenance process to go and fix that problem before it actually occurs. 
Right? So these are all different things that I may want to trigger or ways in which I want to deliver my events. And these are all part of the overall event processing platform capabilities. So what does this allow me to do? As Mark mentioned earlier, it allows me to get ideas to market faster. It allows me to adjust quickly to changing market conditions. And it allows me to deliver in an innovation factory. The speed at which I can now build solutions, the speed at which I can change to what my competitors are doing, and the speed in which I can test new ideas right, is very, very important and very, very critical for allowing me to introduce new capabilities for my customers. This will go ahead and improve business operations and improve the overall customer experience. Now, from a developer, what types of things do I typically look at when determining the overall ROI of a solution? Well, just as some examples, um, one of the things that I'll often look at is the speed of development. Right? How quickly can I translate design to a solution? Right? How easy is it to change the solution? How easy is it for me to iterate through a series of development cycles in order to get the solution that my business wants? And finally, how flexible is the solution? Right? I don't want to be locked into a particular way of doing things. I want to have different ways of defining event rules. I want to be able to extend the product as I need to. I want to be able to present information to users in a language that they understand. And these should be all core capabilities of an event processing platform, and they all will obviously have an impact on overall ROI. Finally, I also want to do things like measure how complex it is to deploy the solution, how easily it can scale to meet my growing demands, and how easy it is to maintain the system going forward. From a business standpoint, I'm obviously going to look at various key performance indicators. My business will have a number of these defined, and I want to look to see how the event processing platform can help me meet and exceed these KPIs. One of the things that I often tell my customers is that not only do you need to look at the numbers, such as costs, profits, and revenue, and so on, but I also need to evaluate how this platform will assist with my customer relationships. I want to look to see how my the timely, relevant, and contextual delivery of data is going to improve the relationship that I have with my customers. Am I giving them relevant offers at a, at a point in time right, that where it makes the most sense for them? Um, am I helping my customers try and predict information or predict failures before they actually occur? Right? Am I providing the maximum value to my customers, again, in a timely fashion? Right? These are things that I actually need to make sure that I'm including in my ROI models. Of course, these models need to be continuously refined. As I learn more, I'm going to want to refine and better my models. And I also want to include my tangible and intangible benefits. So in summary, an event processing platform can deliver high levels of ROI for both IT and the business. By using an event processing platform, I can now look to respond to events in real time and I can detect certain situations sooner rather than later. All right, and we're actually going to see how an event processing platform can help customers get better information and more timely information. Um, in this particular case, it's actually going to be through a transportation logistics example. And then finally, an overall fast data platform allows you to generate event-driven applications that will enable the next generation of digital business. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Glenn, and Glenn is going to walk through a virtual transit example that demonstrates many of these key concepts and capabilities. We're going to take a look now at how um, event processing technology can be used within a particular industry. In this case, we're going to look at a demonstration called virtual transit, which is, shows how event processing could be used in the passenger rail industry. Some of the drivers behind uh, a company adopting event processing, um, traditionally transportation companies relied a lot on paper for modeling, but they were also early adopters of new technology, which gave them better insight, but it was still very much batch oriented and everything was based on historical views, making it difficult to predict future state. And this doesn't really deal very well with exception situations. In addition, there were early adopters of customer-oriented web technology, so customers could plan their journeys on the website as well as get information about disruptions. Um, so this started with computers and then migrated towards mobile devices. Trains themselves have become mobile devices that are in constant communication with the land side, but the communication is often unreliable and it's quite low bandwidth. So you couple this with high-volume data streams means you end up with a bottleneck on the vehicles of getting the data across. 
you have a lot of information sprawl, but very little sharing on the land side. So platforms are hoarding data with no interfaces. Um, there's duplicate data across domain silos that's often out of date or inaccurate. And there's no context, there's no holistic view, no overall view of what's going on. Customers have high expectations. They want to be able to choose their journey using the best information available, but the value of the data is going to be based on its timeliness. And if it's batch oriented, that's probably not going to be the best data that's available. Regulators have high expectations as well, and they've started imposing SLAs on operators in some countries to improve the services that are available. So how do we improve this? We do this with a new event-oriented architecture, um, and we're going to install event servers on the vehicle side. So this means we're now going to be able to receive our onboard event streams onto a server that operates on the vehicle, and we're going to summarize and aggregate that information on the vehicle before storing it and forwarding it onto the land side when most optimal. So something like GPS position, which is quite timely, we might put, put across a 3G network, but we might store things like brake temperatures until the train pulls into the next station and then push that across as a burst over a Wi-Fi network. On the land side, we'll have another event server that will receive the data from all the vehicles in the network and then build a holistic virtual train model from that data. We now have a single source of truth for all the vehicle information, and we can expose this information now to uh, other systems within the enterprise and possibly to the outside world as well. We're going to have a rules engine that will proactively monitor the model with a business-friendly interface that allow you to add and modify rules very quickly. Uh, and we'll do this using things like decision tables and rule templates. We're also going to be able to perform automated actions like sending alerts both internally and externally. We'll have a real-time dashboard for operations staff who can now uh, confirm the network health at a glance. That'll highlight incidents and alerts, and they'll be able to take action in response to situations. And now, of course, we might be able to expose our data now to third parties by, uh, due to the quality of the data, we now might be able to monetize the value of it. Uh, we'll have a resilient gateway with some policy enforcement functions. So now we have a detailed virtual transit model that's a single source of truth that's going to work for both batch and real-time feeds as we move from the old world into the new world. We're going to make improved use of our expensive bandwidth by choosing when to transfer our data across. And we'll have a scalable platform that will allow us to meet our growth targets. We're going to have improved quality and scalability of data to expose it to third parties. And we're going to be able to adapt more quickly both on the micro scale and on the macro scale. So how are we going to do this? We'll start with the event processing platform, which is going to be the engine on the, both the vehicle side and the land side to process the moving data. Contextualize the data into a model in real time and then analyze the model and predictively calculate analytics on the fly. We'll have fast data integration in order to make this happen, uh, resilient messaging between vehicles and land side, and an online in-memory data cache for fast data access. And this will support both batch and event-oriented data sources as we move from one to the other. We'll have a live data mart that gives you an easy-to-use business-friendly interface uh, that allow you to manage and override escalations and configure alerts. We'll have two analytics components, one predictive and one interactive. Predictive analytics will use statistical models to identify situations and alert the uh, exception situations that may happen. And interactive analytics will allow advanced business users to go into the data using tools and spot trends and patterns hidden in those vast quantities of data. And they'll do this using easy to use visualizations. And then finally, we'll have an API management layer that allow us to expose this data now to the outside world. So the component architecture of the demo that we'll see is based around a messaging bus, which is the core of the system, and it's the core communication component that allows everything to talk to one another. The heart of it is the event manager, and this is the event processing platform, and it has a number of rules, decision tables, state models that drive the business logic of the uh, transit application. We don't have any real trains, so we have a simulator that's going to push out messages that correspond to things like train positions, train occupancies, uh, statuses entering and leaving stations, uh, as well as the planning software, planning the trips for the day. We're going to have a real-time dashboard that we can look at what's happening within the system, and we'll be able to follow trains as they move through. And we'll have a web catch and notifier that gives us a fast access in-memory data store uh, where we can access the information that's, that's happening. Of course, we'd expose all this to the outside world by pushing it out to other systems on, uh, that are connected to the messaging bus. 
And in the future, this will be enhanced to add an API gateway for outside parties, and as well some analytics as well by introducing an event aggregator. So let's take a look at the demo. This demonstration is a simple happy path scenario that allow us to familiarize ourselves with some of the features of the virtual train uh, demonstration. So this UI is the live data mart view of what's happening within the event processing platform. And, and we have a number of tabs up here that we can select from. And as well, there's a clock up here in the upper right corner. This is gonna tell us what time it is within the simulation. We operate based on uh, time compression. So one second in real life means one minute within the simulation. Currently nothing's running, so I'm gonna start a new simulation. And we have a number of test cases defined here, but the one in particular we're interested in is this one. So I'm gonna start this. And the first thing that will happen at four in the morning is the planning application is going to schedule the trips for the day. Um, and then about 10 minutes before the departure, it's going to assign the train sets onto a trip. So this train set is now planned. And now at the departure time, the trip will actually depart. So I can select this trip and zoom in on what's happening here. And it's gonna show us a number of pieces of information about this trip. So here we have the list of stops that the train is gonna pass through. We have the set of train sets that are attached to that trip. In this case, we have two train sets assigned, and then we can see any alerts for the trip. We're not gonna have any alerts in this simulation because it's a happy path. Now, the train sets is interesting in this particular simulation because what happens when the train arrives in Rotterdam is it's going to have an additional train set attached onto it. And then when it reaches Amsterdam, that third train set is gonna get dropped off. So you can see we have two right now, and when we reach Rotterdam, the, the UI will regenerate, and we now have three train sets assigned. So this train set view allows you to look at what's the composition of the trip. Um, we can see a summary of the seating availability in each block. So we can see in first class, we have 34 out of 48 seats uh, occupied. And the color of these blocks will change based on the occupancy. We also have an indication of what facilities are available. So you can see this is a toilet. Um, and then further down, we have a cafe available in this coach. And each train set is then represented on here. So that's the first and the second. And then here's the third. We can look at the stops view as well. And this will give us an indication of where the train is going to stop. Um, so we can see we've already departed the first few stations. And we're currently inbound into Schiphol. So you can see there's a, a left column, a center column, and a right column. In the left column, that's the arrival time. And the first row of that is the schedule. The second is business events calculating when it estimates the train will arrive. And then the third will be the actual arrival. So you see the stations we haven't arrived yet only have two, but the ones we have previously passed through already have three. The departure time works the same way. And then the last column tells us what platform the train will arrive and depart from. So the estimated time that's being calculated by business events is actually quite sophisticated because it'll look at a number of pieces of information. If the train lingers at a station and doesn't depart on time, it will take that into account and increment the estimated time accordingly. Likewise, if the train moves slower over a section of track than it should be, that will cause an increase in the estimated time as well. And if the system is aware of alerts that are going on, uh, so for example, uh, speed restrictions over certain segments of track or delays or cancellations of certain stops, it will take that into account to the estimated time as well. So we're arriving at our final uh, destination for this trip. So we've now arrived, we arrived one minute early, which is always good, and that trip is now terminated. So the return trip is scheduled for 1044, so about 10 minutes before the train sets are gonna get assigned, and they'll then manifest themselves on this map. So a trip doesn't have any physical manifestation until a train set uh, gets assigned to it. So we can see we're now assigned, we can select that trip, and we can see we're planned. Uh, we have an indication of our headway status, so we're currently on time. And then along with that, we have some pieces of information assigned uh, that will come out of the GPS uh, installation on the train set. So we have the speed, the current compass bearing, and the distance it's traveled from the start point. So this is the trip view. We also have a train set view, which is slightly different because it gives you a view of the actual hardware. So you can see we have two dots that are kind of following one another here. They're not actually tailgating one another. These are the two train sets that are composing the trip that we're doing at the moment. So if I select one of these, we can see this is train set one of two, uh, and then the other would be two of two for that particular trip. Uh, and now we've attached a third one, so we now actually have a three of three. 
So in addition to this view, we're able to do some lightweight analytics as well. So these are all driven off of live data mark queries, but if I needed to do my own, I would be able to do that as well. So I can do trips, trip ID, um, last updated and status, and validate that query, and then do a live view of that. And this will update as it goes through. And finally, we have an alerts view as well. And again, we have no alerts in this scenario, uh, but we could create an alert or view an alert using this UI. So we'll have a look at a more advanced use case. This demonstration shows more advanced features of the system. In particular, I'm going to introduce alerts into it to cause delays uh, to particular trips. So I'm going to start a new simulation, which is going to be a happy path sim simulation again. And it's a half day of services between or Dordrecht and Amsterdam. So the planning application will first schedule all the trips for the day, and there should be a fair number of them come up here. And then our first trip is at 5.12 in the morning. So about 10 minutes before that, we should get a train set assigned, which has happened. And we should get another one for 5.20 as well, opposite, operating in the opposite direction. And these will start moving shortly. So these services are now underway. And then the subsequent services will operate at their appropriate times. So I'm going to go to the alerts view here, and I'm going to create a new alert. I'm going to apply it to the 2990 service, which will just be the northbound services. I can select a particular trip, but I'm going to apply it to all the trips, and I'm going to leave that blank. And I'm going to create a weather alert. So weather, minor delays, uh, delays between our dam and Delft due to high winds. And the approximate delay is going to be about 30 minutes. And in this table here, we have a list of the stops for this particular service. And what I can do is I can apply speed limits on each segment of track here. So I'm going to put a speed limit of 0.5 from Black Central, and then 0.25, and 0.25 again. And I'll create that alert. So you can see the alert has appeared now in this table. I can go back to trips here. And we can see now we've highlighted the segment of track and a number of stations that currently have alerts applied to them. So I can select the station, and we can see the trips that are scheduled to go through, and we can see the alerts that are associated with that station. Now, if you notice, this trip has a little exclamation point icon on it, and this indicates that an alert has been associated with this particular train. We can go in and see the weather alert, and we can see we have an increasing delay that's happening here. And this is because the speed that the train is traveling at is less than the design for the particular segment of track. In fact, that's because we've put a speed limit on it. Normally, this train would be operating about 80 kilometers an hour on this segment of track. And Business Events is using this information and recalculating the subsequent stops and the estimated time for each one of these. So you can see it's already determined that uh, the Den Haag arrival is going to be 21 minutes late, and this is incrementing as the train gets delayed going through the segment of track. And you would see here we have a number of delays being applied uh, as the trains go through that section, that section, and we've also highlighted trains that are going to be impacted by this uh, with this little icon. If we go back to the alerts view here, we see we have two other alerts that have been generated. They're both called block delay, minor, minor delays. This is business events looking at the knock-on effect of a delayed trip impacting subsequent trips. So train sets don't operate in isolation. They'll operate one service in one direction and then turn around and return again. In this particular scenario, these outbound trains are being delayed, so this is having a knock-on effect on the return trips that are coming back again. So business events is creating an alert for these trips and then highlighting these trips as being delayed due to these uh, late-running inbound services. So if we go back to trips view here, we can see uh, we can see the knock-on effect of this on the return trips and the estimated delays that are occurring because of this. So you can see very quickly that even a minor um, disruption to the system gets reflected in here very easily and very quickly. So I can go back to the alerts view again, and I can clear this weather alert. I can go in and say weather is normal, and then select clear here, and that alert will now be deactivated. So the weather alert has been cleared, 
If I go back to trips, you can see the segment of track in those stations have resumed to normal, and the subsequent trips are no longer subject to delays, but the ones that have already been delayed by that alert are now still operating with their delays intact. I can select the alert here and it's changed the icon to indicate that the alert still impacted the trip, but it's now been cleared. Once you have built a virtual transit application like this, what are the, some of the things that you can do with it? Um, here's some use cases that we've, we've looked at and identified. In particular, I want to look at what the customer uh, personalized journey planning or disrupted journey rerouting might look like. If you think about a GPS, a uh, modern GPS in a car, it's connected to um, a centralized server that can tell us what the traffic situation is, and it will reroute you dynamically as that situation changes. What we want to do is build something like that, but for a transit user, where they can take a train, say, from Rotterdam to Amsterdam, and if their train is delayed along the way, the system will proactively tell them they're going to be delayed and what their new estimated time is in Amsterdam, and it may tell them that they're currently on the train that will get them there quickest. If their journey gets disrupted again further along, uh, and this time, say, the train gets cancelled before it reaches its final destination, it will come back and say, at Leiden Station, you need to alight from the train and go to Platform 4. You need to get on the train that departs in 15 minutes, that will arrive in Amsterdam in 30 minutes, um, and you need to stand next to pillar number three for the maximum chance to find a place to sit. So this is now a more personalized interaction with the system, and the customer experience is going to be improved by this. Well, thanks, Glenn, for the demonstration. I really like how you brought together the key characteristics and concepts of the event processing platform and, and showed how they relate to the transportation industry. So we do have some questions here that came in from the audience, so I'd just like to take a moment and address a couple of those. Um, the first question is really talking about, uh, is fast data more valuable than big data? And I think here, this actually just relates to the idea that in many cases, you're not looking at value of one over the other. Um, you're really looking at applying both types of processing techniques in order to achieve overall value for the business. So fast data is going to have a certain set of value drivers associated with it, as does your traditional big data processing. You know, we have talked about how fast data can bring you information in a more timely and relevant fashion. And we've discussed also how the, or what the ROI is around that type of processing. Um, and big data, in, you know, in, in comparison speaking, also has a number of valuable uh, features and characteristics. So I don't know if it's really a situation where one is more valuable than the other. I think in this use case and in certain circumstances, it's definitely true, but both techniques are going to provide you with additional value. The second question is really around uh, men talking about additional use cases where event processing could be used. So we've obviously demonstrated how event processing can be used in the transportation industry, but really these techniques um, these characteristics, this overall processing pipeline can be applied to essentially any vertical. So whether you're in finance, looking at things like fraud detection, whether you're in the energy space, monitoring smart meters, whether you're in oil and gas, monitoring the wells themselves, whether you're in retail, providing real-time relevant cross-sell upsell offers, whether you're processing clickstream data and reacting appropriately, government, number of use cases there around monitoring and tracking. So really, these, these characteristics, these types of processing paradigms can be applied to almost any vertical. And finally, the last question, um, what does it take to deploy an event architecture? And what are some of the challenges we hear about from our customers? Really, it's, it's a matter of determining, first of all, the relevant use cases that would benefit from an event processing approach. Um, this is often one of the main challenges that we see. It, uh, it um, usually requires customers to uh, kind of dream a little bit, right? Start to see where they want to take their current batch processing capabilities and which aspects of those batch capabilities you want to offload or move to more of a real-time capability. And it goes back to the original discussion as well that we had around value. So once you've identified the use cases that can benefit from this approach, you then need to look at what inputs are available. And sometimes you need to go get additional data or you need to event enable your data sources so you can get those real-time feeds of data. And then you need to look at what kind of characteristics and processing you want to perform against the inbound information. Once that's identified, don't forget to actually 
do something with those end results, right? You don't want to just hide what the end results are. You want to make sure that they're visible and presented to the appropriate audience, again, in a timely and relevant fashion. That's the last question. So thank you everybody for attending um, and please engage with us. There's more contact information here on this particular slide, um, whether it's from the blog, following uh, the TIBCO resources on Twitter or contacting your TIBCO account executive. Thank you.